Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest and California Weather Watch. And tonight we are going to take a look at the August 2024 ENSO update. We're going to be looking at the Climate Prediction Center and all its predictions here as we go through the season, the fall and the winter months coming up. We're going to take a special look at some of the snowfall here for the Pacific Northwest all the way from 1952, the current time frame. And we're going to take a look at the monkey wrench that Mother Nature is trying to throw into the entire process. But this is looking currently, you can see we do have this cold pool building across the eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. And that is good if you want La Nina. It's been a bit slow, though, to translate towards the surface. But you can also see the above average conditions here. So kind of a La Nina-ish looking picture here. And we're going to dive into a lot of information on this as we go through the video here tonight. So what does ENSO stand for? It means El Nino Southern oscillation so you can impress all your friends with your meteorological knowledge of that acronym that is known as ENSO. Now taking a look at the forecast here for August 2024 again we've been slowing down that transition the models initially were saying it was going to be a little bit quicker but we've been hanging up a bit here as we're going through the summer months but we still should get there you know you're talking about 70 percent chance um, and some of the models are showing us remaining in neutral here, but we'll go over some of that data here. It's just not that the odds have been dropping a little bit. And if we take a look at the CFS, it starts to bring this decline and even brings us into a moderate La Nina territory here as we go through November and December. And if you look to the right, you got September, October, November, December, January, February, and March. You can clearly see the cold tongue there across the equatorial Pacific marking those La Nina conditions. So the official Climate Prediction Center probability chart here shows that we're still up over 70% chance, but you can see the odds of remaining in neutral have increased a little bit here. And uh, El Nino for this season is virtually at you know maybe 1% chance or something like that. Very unlikely. Now, this is where we measure those conditions across the equatorial Pacific. There's Hawaii, there's Australia, there's South America, there's North America, and there's Japan here. So again, between 170 West and 120 West, that is Nino 3.4 plus and minus 5 degrees across the equatorial Pacific. There's Nino 4 in the blue box, Nino 3 is in the red box, and Nino 1 plus 2 is right up against the coast there for South America. And we are officially in that La Nina watch right now. The odds are we are headed there. We're currently at 0.0. .0 right now august 8th the most recent one strictly right neutral typical temperatures there averaged out across nino 3.4 and again, there it is right there. But if you take a look at Nino 4, it's been declining. 3.4 has been declining. It dropped down a little bit, but it bounced back. But it's kind of typical there. And you can see the water right up against the coast of South America, generally a little bit below average. So about a 74% chance by the time we get to November through January that La Nina will be coming in the latest diagnostic discussion. Now, if we take a look at the past El Nino here, so you can kind of see uh, the, it lasted for about 12 months, but for May and June, you can see the temperature is falling, probably gonna be right around zero there by the time July temperatures come through. So, you know, we're on our way, perhaps down towards that La Nina period as we go, but you can also see our triple dip La Nina back here, the three previous years to last year's El Nino. Now, this is the general pattern. This is a very overall pattern here. You can see the high blocking pressure, kind of a characteristic sign of La Nina with the wetter and cooler conditions here across Pacific Northwest. You see some drier across some of the Southern states. And when we get El Nino, you have the more extended wetter jet stream that usually brings some of Central and Southern California uh, wetter conditions. You can also see the warmer during uh, El Nino across Alaska and British Columbia down towards the Pacific Northwest. So again, one more look at that here, uh, polar jet stream, usually nice heat transfer back up into the polar regions here. And then we end up getting this big ridge of high pressure and you end up bringing that more variable jet stream back down into the Pacific Northwest. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at some of the models here, this is the CFS and you can clearly see this is for September. You see the cold tongue here emerging across the equatorial Pacific and this would be for October. So clearly a La Nina signature here, even though you do have some above average uh, temperatures right along the immediate coast of South America. Now, as we go on in through November, you can see it does increase here. So the CFS is pretty bullish on bringing those La Nina conditions in. I'm going to show you the European here in a moment, though. It's not in full agreement. We all also have this that might be working in our favor for cooler than normal conditions across the Pacific Northwest. We've been in PDO negative for a while now. I still believe we are there right now. The sea surface temperatures kind of point and hint that we still are. So that could actually help us remain below average here with that cooler than normal water off some of the Northeast Pacific where the meets the Pacific Northwest. 
Now, taking a look here, this goes all the way back for September 2022. The blue line is what actually occurred. So this was the forecast put out by the European model here and all of its ensemble members. So you see when the blue line is the middle of all these ensemble members, it's doing pretty good there. You know, it's a pretty good forecast. And you can see for October 2022, November, December, doing pretty good here. And you can kind of see within the envelope of the ensemble members as we go through April 2023, we continue on through August. Now, you'll notice that on August 2023, things got a little bit shaken up here as the actual temperatures across the equatorial Pacific were on, a little bit on the low side there. And that's how that La Ni the El Nino, sorry, didn't get quite as strong as we had predicted initially. And it kind of stayed on the, the the low side of the ensemble members as we went through August 2023. Same thing with November, a little bit on the low side in December as well. And then we go on in through January, February, March. And if we take a look at that, March goes all the way up. We have data through July. So that's why that dotted line goes to July and then stops right there. So again, we've been on the warm side here. You can kind of see the models thought we'd be heading down towards La Nina conditions a little bit quicker here. And we've kind of tailed off on that and leveled off right there in neutral conditions. So this is the March 2024. If we go to May and June and in May, you know, the temperature is really on the warm side here of that ensemble member grouping and same thing for June. And then we look at July. Obviously, we don't have the actual data of what occurs because this is just the forecast for July and August. But the main takeaway from this is you got to get down to this dashed line to get to La Nina conditions. And the European is like, hey, not so fast, man. We might end up in neutral conditions as we go through the fall and the winter months. But Neutral years can be quite interesting as well. You know, it's it's not as strong a signal as being warm for like an El Nino, for example. You still can get some active weather. And there have been some papers, for example, that talk about windstorms that we get sometimes during those ocean, ocean transition years, we can get some pretty big windstorms as well. So we do have some active weather that could be rolling in. And now this is taking a look at the most recent here this is august 14th you can see again that a tongue of cool water kind of moving across the area there it almost looks like it should be slightly in negative but i guess it averaged out to right around zero there but anyway this is the most recent and the upwelling you know comes up from, from beneath the ocean here and then moves off the coast of south america and extends back out across the area okay so now, taking a look at what's going on here, when you get these trade winds here, pulling things away, that's normal conditions and it's just kind of modified. But once you get towards the La Nina conditions here, you get the increased trade winds here and you take that nicely heated ocean there from, of course, the daily, the diurnal sun cycle, and it pushes that water off to the west. So you get the warmer air, water and the warmer air here in turn. Because that transitions into the atmosphere. You've got the colder water there across portions of, or colder air across portions of Asia, big continent over there, and you get the stronger jet stream, and you get a, a big heat transfer here that usually goes up to the polar areas, and then you get the big ridge downstream here. So we get this more variable, cooler jet stream back into the Pacific Northwest. Hope that makes sense there. Now, neutral conditions here, again, kind of what I showed you on the slide a couple slides ago there and kind of typical setup here when known as the Pacific Walker circulation. So again, usually the Western Pacific is warmer than the Eastern Pacific here. It's just kind of how the currents on the ocean go. And then you get that warmer water here. You build up these thunderstorms and whatnot. But when you go into La Nina conditions, that gets even enhanced here. And these trade winds really pick up and push that warm water and bunch it up here across the Western Pacific Ocean, like I just mentioned a couple slides ago so el nino conditions things change a little bit there we start to get the lower pressure here closer towards tahiti and then you start to get the thunderstorm activity that extends a bit out across the pacific ocean and that can bring a stronger jet stream into the west coast of north america and bring warmer than normal conditions and wetter than normal conditions for portions of california so how do we know if the walker circulation is starting to show el nino conditions and this is where mother nature has kind of thrown us a little bit of a curveball. One way is by looking at the Southern Oscillation Index. So again, El Nino, your pressure is going to be lower here versus Darwin, Australia. And so these records have been taken for a long time, over 100 years. And so we can kind of look back into the past there. So again, high pressure here for Darwin, lower pressure here for Tahiti. Of course, La Nina, you reverse that. You got lower pressure here over Darwin. You got higher pressure here for Tahiti. 
Now, if we take a look at what's been going on, we started to bounce back into some of the positive territory there, showing maybe some La Nina conditions were emerging. If you look all the way back to the beginning of this timeline, it goes back to January 1951 here, and you can see we go all the way through the years, and here's 2024. So this is the, La, the El Nino we went through. There's the triple dip La Nina we went through. So it looked like we were bouncing back to La Nina conditions, but look at this. We dropped back negative again here. So the atmosphere is still confused, and it does not show typical La Nina conditions in the atmosphere as of yet. It's kind of typical right now. We're still transitioning, but right now it kind of still thinks we're in a bit of an El Nino scenario as far as the pressure is from based on Darwin, Australia towards Tahiti. So you can kind of see this. Take, take a look here. This is February 18th at the top of this graph, and there's August 11th at the bottom. You can kind of see along the coast of South America and out into the Nino 3.4 region, we have cooled things off. You know, you can see the El Nino clearly here, and now we've cooled things off, and we're down into the neutral conditions here. So kind of a running timeline there of the sea surface temperatures across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Now, of course, where that warm water across the equatorial, the equatorial Pacific builds up means a big deal. You know, where that heat transfer takes place has big implications on how the energy feeds and these Rossby waves develop. And these Rossby waves end up having storms with them and the mid-latitude cyclones. And the stronger the gradient, the stronger the storm. So that's how that transitions. And of course, you know, that's why they call them mid-latitude cyclones. you got the colder air across the polar regions and the much warmer air across the, the equatorial regions, of course. Now, um, this is one more look, a little bit closer here, of the variable jet stream. This is kind of a classic signature here. And, and you know, you, you study meteorology for a little while here across the Pacific Northwest, and you know when the winter months come and the high pressure builds out over, you know, the Pacific Ocean here, it allows for some of that cooler air to drive down into the region. So that's something we watch for. Now, this is the fun stuff here. We get to look at the seasonal temperature outlook. This is for September, October, November. You can see the heat continuing across portions of the southwest, perhaps extending into some of the Pacific Northwest. But you can see also a little bit of an above average signal. And this, again, hot off the presses, August 15th seasonal outlook new stuff coming in here so this is october november december you can see equal chances for a lot of the pacific northwest but again that above average signal continues to show for precipitation so that'd be good for drought conditions and now this is november december january we don't start to see up below average just yet but again the above average signal does exist and again these were issued august 15th and now we're starting to look all the way out into 2025 but you'll see things start to change a little bit here. Look at that seasonal temperature outlook. This is classic La Nina stuff now. Northern states, Montana, North Dakota here, and the Pacific Northwest with the best below normal signal here of any place in the lower 48. And look at this precipitation signal there. <laughs> Pretty nice to see that, you know, the strongest signal right smack dab across the Pacific Northwest. But on the flip side here for my California folks, you got some below normal signal showing up precipitation wise as we go through the winter months also. Now, this is January, February, March, again with that below average signal here. So I know the mossbacks are loving that. I know the snowbirds are loving that for the higher terrain. And you know, these La Nina years, you can get some pretty good snowfalls down into the lower elevations as well. We'll take a look at that here in a moment. Now, if we go February, March, April, again, that below normal signal here, pretty typical for La Nina years that ex can extend all the way out into the early spring with the above average signal. But look at that below normal signal still across the Southwest USA. Not great. And if we go on into our next, next spring, that below normal signal continues to exist in the below normal signal for temperature across the Pacific Northwest. Now, this is um, actually, yeah, this is what I want to look at now. So this is 1950 to 2024. This is just the raw data on my huge Excel spreadsheet where I just pump all this data in, then I overlay it with ENSO numbers. So you can see the winter of 1949 to 1950 be here, and every single year for SeaTac is listed here, and the amount of snowfall that has fallen. And I probably should have took that strong out. That doesn't really apply here. It doesn't matter too much. But you can see the great winter of 1950, huge snowfall amounts. That was a strong La Nina year there. But what I want to point you to here first, for starters, is let's look at the zeros. They're all El Nino years in the very low one there at 0 0.5 for 63, 64. And look at 69, 70 was also El Nino. But every single year that we had zero snowfall, was an El Nino year. La Nina has never had a season where we have been skunked, if you can believe that. And we have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine years during this time frame of 1950 to 2024 that we had no snowfall. They were all El Nino years. And also on that same uh, side of the coin there, the, the neutral years have also all had snowfall as well. So if we remain in neutral years, you can bet somebody, hey, I'll bet you that we get snow at SeaTac and you'd probably be a pretty strong bet. Now, looking back in the past a little bit here, the 68-69 epic winter here was actually in El Nino, and we got huge amounts of snowfall and a couple of just monster storms during that season. So just because we have an El Nino, sometimes Mother Nature throws us a complete curveball and flips everything on its head and kind of shows you the huge snowfall amounts it can produce. But you can also see some of these La Nina years going back through the past as well, not bad. And some of these neutral years performed quite well. Look at 96-97. What is this, 85, 86? That's the great November snows of 1985. I can remember that. I think I was well, I middle school back then, and we missed like a whole week of school with just two absolutely powerful snowstorms that hit in the month of November. So if we scroll ahead a little bit here more, you can see uh, 2008, 2009. Now, a lot of people that's, that live here in the Pacific Northwest remember that it was the snowiest winter for some time. In fact, all the way back since, what, 1971, 72. So that's older than I am. And you can see that was the snowiest winter in many, many years, in decades, in fact. But again, occasionally we can get some of these really huge snowfall years. And it doesn't necessarily have to be La Nina versus El Nino. But... The zero years are all El Nino here. So it's kind of interesting. But since we're headed towards a neutral La Nina period, we have a pretty good chance. And this really translates to the, the higher terrain as well. And sometimes Seattle, these numbers don't represent what happens up for places like Everett, Bellingham, and some of Vancouver, BC, and some of the mountainous areas as well. And even for Portland, you know, things can vary quite a bit here. I'm working on Portland data right now, and I'm probably going to show that in the next upcoming months. And we're going to take a look at some of what Portland gets also. Now, just because you're in a La Nina versus an El Nino doesn't mean you're stuck in that pattern for the entire year. We have what's known as the Madden-Julian Oscillation here. And this is a pattern that moves across the planet between 30 and 60 days. And as this energy moves across the equatorial Pacific, it can change how the heat transfer interacts with Rossby wave activity. So you can get different impacts depending on what kind of Madden-Julian Oscillation phase you are in. So you can kind of see just if you move into phase seven, the atmosphere can mimic El Nino at times and it can mimic La Nina or enhance the La Nina conditions at other times. And this is just more on the Madden-Julian Oscillation. You can see increased rainfall and this propagates across the equatorial Pacific from uh, uh, west to east in, again, 30 to 60 days in the timeline on that. And I just want to kind of throw this out as well. I know some of you guys have been seeing this in the news about the exceptional warmth in the global ocean for more than a year. And we're going on the second year here. And it's kind of concerning there that we are just absolutely blowing away all previous records for the ocean warmth. I plan on doing... A video here, it's probably going to be a bit controversial, but I'm planning on doing a global warming video. So I don't talk about it much because I do, I am not an expert in this data, but what I'm going to go over is what the experts have to say about it. Whether you disagree with this or not, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people that get quite upset when I, when we talk about this or whatnot. So I'm going to tell you what the experts have to say. And if for no, no other reason, it's just good to know what the experts have to say and what the data says on the topic here. So I'm probably going to do a video on that here coming up in the next month or so. Let me know what you guys think. Too controversial or you guys want to hear about it, let me know in the comments down below. But yeah, Crazy weather coming up here this weekend for the Pacific Northwest. Looking forward to that. Getting all my gear ready. I'll be out chasing. I'll probably be live streaming at some point. Maybe do a live stream tomorrow after the morning video, of course. I'll do my normal briefings as well. So hope you guys are looking forward to that also. Looking forward to the weather picking up down in California as well. I'm sure it will do so before too long as we move on into the later fall and the winter months. So anyway, hope you guys are having a good day. I'll do my normal briefings tomorrow and I will talk to you guys then.